Well, there's a lot to talk about. Let's get to our panel here in our studio. Lin Peng is an attorney, expert in electronic commerce and internet law. From Hong Kong, Monsieur Ahmed is the managing director of FinStep Asia, also from Hong Kong. Paul Sin is the Asia Pacific Blockchain Lab leader at Deloitte. And Emin Gun Sire is an associate professor at Cornell University. He joins us from New York. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Monsieur Ahmed, let me start with you in Hong Kong. China is pushing blockchain technology. What does that mean? How significant is that? What can we expect? When we look at the announcement by President Xi in terms of pushing blockchain, it's not something that's starting right away. China has been looking at blockchain for the last five years. We've had discussions on the national currency for a while, but we also had consortiums like the Fisco Consortium in Shenzhen made up of multiple institutions like Huawei, Tencent, WeBank, and others who have been using blockchain for various applications. What this announcement does is it helps push the agenda in terms of having research and standardization across the country in terms of adoption of blockchain and further fuels research and uh, investment into the technology. So, Moshir, when we talk about cryptocurrencies, are we talking about just a digital currency, something that exists electronically? You could say that, but uh, in a sense, a cryptocurrency is a currency on the blockchain, and there are various ways of transferring that. Now, one thing that people often confuse is mixing blockchain with cryptocurrencies. Blockchain is just a technology, and cryptocurrency is an application. There are various ways a cryptocurrency can be generated. You can generate like the Bitcoin, which is by solving cryptographic uh, puzzles, or you can do it by contributing to the general cause in terms of proof of uh, work. So it is important to understand that a cryptocurrency is a digital currency, but you could say that in, in present modern day, you can have digital tokens that transfer money from one entity to another without the use of any physical paper. All right, let's bring in Paul Sin, who is also in Hong Kong. Paul, your company, Deloitte, they surveyed... Uh about a thousand companies across seven countries and found that a third are already using blockchain uh, and another 41 percent plan yep. to use a blockchain application in the next year. Uh, what can you tell us about this survey? So um, when we look at all the corporates that are using blockchain, they are actually not using what uh, we call public blockchain or permissionless blockchain. Um, when we talk about uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum or crypto asset ICO, we're actually talking about a network where uh, all the users are anonymous and you need to solve some puzzle which we also call mining, consume a lot of power and spend a lot of time to process each transaction. And this kind of blockchain are public blockchains. Um, when we help enterprise and corporates to adopt blockchain, we're usually using permission blockchain meaning all the users on the network are named users. They are not anonymous. And because of that, uh, there is, mm, um, the risk of money laundry is lower, and uh, it's less likely that people will break the uh, currency control, which is uh, quite common in uh, Asia. So um, when we use permission blockchain, the real problem we are trying to solve is a secure way to synchronize data uh, B2B, so from business to business. Uh, for example, if a bank wants to collaborate with insurance on bank assurance product, then they will use blockchain. Or if a healthcare company wants to transfer um, patient data with an insurance company, they will use blockchain because all the data being transferred are sensitive. So uh, most of our projects are uh, with this nature. Um, public blockchain projects are usually not used in enterprise uh, uh, world. Professor Sarah, I saw one of your tweets in which you said that so many academics uh, forget that the goal as, uh, as a profession is not to publish papers, it's to change the world. So tell us, how will this technology change the world? The blockchain technology has uh, offered some fundamental, uh, fundamentally new ways of doing, uh, uh, doing business. It um, uh, eliminates the need for trust and it allows people to compete on the world stage. Uh, speaking specifically for China, for example, China is the world's manufacturing hub. It makes most of the products we use in the Western world, but it's not the, uh, the center of the branding. So a, a Westerner, for example, will uh, most likely go and buy a, uh, uh, a baby monitor from, um, from Motorola or a, or a Western brand like that, even if the exact same uh, device is available from uh, a Chinese manufacturer. 
And the reason for that is because they don't understand, they don't know uh, to trust the brand that they don't recognize. What the blockchain technology can do for us is it allows us to change, uh, to change that equation, to allow people to use devices without uh, having to worry about what the device can and cannot do because the technology itself is self-assuring. It allows people to audit, to test what happens on the back end. It allows people to say that this is what this device is capable of doing and no more. And we would get that assurance from where? From the fact that many people are using it or people just collectively put their trust in this? No, no. It's, uh, you get that assurance from knowing what happens and what cannot happen uh, by virtue of having examined the blockchain itself. The blockchain allows people to, to audit uh, the business flow, the business logic, and all of the operations that take place on the back end. Uh, Lin Peng, one of the key applications for uh, blockchain is cryptocurrency, but this has been criticized because it's not controlled by a central bank. It's anonymous, uh, and it could be open to money laundering, to financial terrorism. Uh, is there some validity to these concerns? Yes, absolutely, um, because, you know, um, Bitcoin, when it first came into place, a lot of like people think it's, it has a very bad reputation just because some uh, anonymous transactions that facilitate a lot of like illegal activities. So uh, that's why a lot of like globally, a lot of governments are starting to take actions, uh, trying to track all the illegal transactions. And also for people who issue the tokens on blockchain, they impose certain kind of obligations for the parties to conduct a KYC and AML. For example, in the United States, although security token offerings are allowed, but in order to do this sort of offering, you have to make sure uh, you know the customers and you make sure you take reasonable steps to make sure th um, the anti-laundry um, compliance has been in place. And also it imposes a lot of obligations on the exchangers that facilitate the trading of the tokens and uh, ask them to report a lot of suspicious transactions. So we would have to put some kind of regulatory mechanism in place to make sure that these transgressions don't take place? Correct, because um, some of the regulations um, <coughs> actually originate from the reputation that, um, yes, blockchain is created so that it's kind of uh, eliminate the central control. Mm -hmm. But people have the misconception, say, yeah, because it's a new product, so it's a wild west. We don't need any like a regulatory regime in order to regulate people's conducts. But regulation itself is very technology agnostic. So it won't regulate the uh, technology itself. Technology itself can be good, can be bad, but the regulations are targeting on the users, like people who use the technologies. Whether if you have like good efforts, that's good, but if yeah. you are like a bad factors, like a bad actors, you have to comply with the law. If you violate the laws, of course you have to face any um, enforcement actions. Okay, Professor Seri, what are your thoughts on how the users of this technology are going to be regulated? Um, so the regulators, at least in the West, have actually taken a very light-handed touch to the blockchain space. They realize the importance of this technological innovation. They want to be at the forefront, and they have uh, typically refrained from coming in uh, with a very heavy-handed uh, set of legislation, for example. What they have done instead is try to regulate it at the edges, at the conversion between, uh, say, uh, existing cryptocurrencies and regular sovereign-issued fiat mechanisms. So that's where they have uh, uh, decided to exert control, and that has worked quite well. Um, but uh, as the previous panelists said, I think one of the main problems with these technologies is that they've been designed from the ground up, in some sense, to evade uh, controls. Mm -hmm. And uh, they create a, a sort of an extra legal system to the side of our regular, proper, um, you know, regulated world. And so that causes issues for, for sovereigns. They want to be able to say, well, here are the kinds of transactions you can and cannot engage in. And, uh, and they want to be able to control that. What we're going to see in the next year or, or two uh, is the emergence of new coins that merge better uh, between both the, the crypto, the blockchain world, and the regular financial world as we know it. Right. Mashir Ahmed, there was a piece in Forbes magazine recently uh, which said that the Chinese central bank is looking at developing a digital yuan that can be used as a global currency. Uh, how can a digital currency facilitate global trade, for instance? 
when you're looking at a digital currency facilitating uh, global trade, you're talking about use, use of internet and a global access. One of the things with the blockchain is that it can be cross-border and can be seamless. Hence, when you're using the digital yuan, you don't need to go through certain uh, con conditions and checks when it comes to cross-border transfers, and a digital yuan can be done real-time, uh, and it can be tracked completely from end to end. So it gives the users on both ends, as well as the regulatory body, a good oversight. An example of that is what the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the Thai Central Bank have issued as of yesterday. They've issued a, a new digital token for trade between the two countries, and this can be expanded between uh, Hong Kong to other countries beyond the Thai countries. The way it's being done is the Hong Kong Monetary Authority issues a digital token mm -hmm. that is used by businesses in Hong Kong, and they can then exchange those digital tokens for digital Thai Bhat, and Thai Bhat, uh, Thai con uh, companies can use that for uh, internally. So that exchange will be facilitated by the central governments. And in a similar way, when the digital yuan comes on board or the uh, DCEP that we're looking at, you will then see a similar s smooth movement of flow between uh, different central banks and businesses. And I would want to add that uh, the digital yuan, I don't think, is going to be as much of an impact when it comes to the retail customers. I would expect it to be more in circulation when it comes to B2B and the trade side of things. Right, Paul Sin, uh, what are we to make of countries that issue their own cryptocurrency? We have the example of Turkey, for instance, which has launched a cryptocurrency called Belira, uh, which is backed by the Turkish lira, in fact. So, one point of correction, uh, B lira is not uh, issued by the Turkish government. It is backed by the Turkish lira, but it is not the official uh, currency issued by the this Turkish Central Bank. The Turkish Central Bank is working on such an issuance, uh, and it plans to do it later on in 2020. Uh, B lira is a private enterprise, uh, jumping the gun, if you will, right. and offering this much-needed uh, instrument to the Turkish uh, public. Right. Uh, Paul, what do you make of countries issuing their, old, uh, their own cryptocurrency? So um, I think issuing a cryptocurrency is not really uh, what the, a lot of central banks are trying to do now. They, uh, they, or they can issue a digital currency without using blockchain because a lot of countries are already using uh, digital currency in a way. Like in China, people use uh, WeChat Pay, use Alipay. Um, so what we actually need is uh, for global trade, when we need to do cross-border remittance, we need a more efficient way without uh, having a lot of fees and middlemen in the transactions. Uh, Lin Peng, you know, we were talking about the uh, digital yuan. Um, at, m at the moment, the U.S. dollar is the currency used in international trade. Do you think that the digital yuan uh, can be more easily adopted as the standard for international trade? Uh, first, I want to make a distinguish between the digital yuan and the cryptocurrency because yeah. every obviously there are a lot of like differences and a lot of you know um, misconceptions. Digital yuan, uh, the major motivation is going to facilitate the internationalization of RMB, the Chinese currency. So it's really um, motivated to reduce the transaction costs among banks. So as um, one of the panelists described, it won't, probably won't really affect the consumer level because it's going to um, sort of like digitalize the, e digital, uh, digitalize the transactions so that uh, the settlements can be conducted uh, more efficiently and more securely just because a lot of uh, data information will be transferred among banks. So they want to make sure it's, uh, it's facilitated efficiency and uh, security. So it's, it's more like uh, uh, the central bank digital currency. So it's uh, um, in addition to the trust that we put on the blockchain, which is based on uh, algorithm, mm -hmm. they also impose their sovereign trust. So make sure you know people won't be subjected to any systematic risk that people would imagine that uh, on financial, the large scale financial institution would face. Professor Siri, the uh, Facebook CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, he recently testified in Congress about the Facebook backed currency, the Libra. Uh, let's listen to what he had to say. But I also hope that we get a chance to talk about the risks of not innovating. Because while we debate these issues, the rest of the world isn't waiting. China is moving quickly to launch a similar idea in the coming months. But if America doesn't innovate, our financial leadership is not guaranteed. 
So, Professor Siri, I mean, we know that there is not that uh, a lot, there's not a lot of enthusiasm in the White House for blockchain or for cryptocurrencies. Uh, does the United States run the risk of lagging behind? The U.S. does run the risk of, running, of well, falling behind in this race. Um, so cryptocurrencies really represent a completely different way of architecting Internet services. They change us from uh, client server services, where you're always beholden to a counterparty, where you're always beholden to a service provider like Facebook, like Google, like whatever, whoever is providing that service to you, to a different architecture where you're not actually uh, beholden to any centralized uh, person, entity, uh, or anything else of the kind, where there's nobody in charge, where there is nobody to, to behave in a malfeasance, to, to exhibit malfeasance. So the kinds of concerns that people have with Facebook having abused its uh, special position about, of uh, knowing all about us um, are, just don't apply to blockchains. So I think uh, part of the, the pushback against blockchains that we have seen from the White House actually come from, uh, from the threat to USD dominant side and not so much against the technology itself. The blockchain, the technology is here to stay. It's very hard to censor and it really does uh, pr promise quite a bit uh, to, uh, in terms of technology and no nation, no advanced nation can afford to, to fall behind here. Monsieur Ahmed, uh, at the uh, consumer level, China has taken the lead uh, in, the, uh, in digital payments uh, through mobile devices. Let's take a look uh, at that, and we have a report from uh, Ge Yunfei on that. Let's watch this. Consumers in China transacted nearly 280 trillion yuan in mobile payments alone last year. That's nearly 42 trillion U.S. dollars, and more than three times the nation's total GDP. WeChat Pay, one of the most popular mobile payment apps in China, now has 800 million monthly active users across the nation. They also bring this habit to foreign countries like Japan. We can also use WeChat to pay here, just like in China. It's very convenient for us because the language won't bother us anymore. In the past three years, we basically covered 46 countries that Chinese tourists like to visit, spanning 16 different currencies. And apart from payment, we are also trying to establish a mobile payment ecosystem in those countries. WeChat's mobile payment success is also drawing the attention of Facebook. Recently, the world's biggest social network launched its plan for Libra, a global cryptocurrency. For many industry insiders, Facebook's ambitious move into the world of digital payments can be seen as an effort to emulate the success of WeChat. Some are even saying that Libra will completely replace the current mobile payment tools in the future. But facing the potential competition, will WeChat and the Chinese payment giant follow suit? Major countries like China and the U.S. and several international organizations have all voiced their opposition to the liberal cryptocurrency, mainly due to concerns of privacy, money laundering, and supervision issues. I think the tech is, is there and, and, and the, the technology is definitely at a certain uh, length where it's possible. The problem is, is with regulations and with government, uh, there's a lot of red tape you have to go through to kind of make these things uh, officially happen. Experts say, at least in the near future, the current mobile payment tools will still be the dominant force in the global market. Ge Yunfei, CGTN, Guangzhou. Monsieur Ahmed, uh, listening to that report there on the use of digital payments, WeChat, and the possibility of Libra being used, uh, what can you tell us about how this is being used already in Asia? When we look at um, Asian super apps, right, you've got to understand that a lot of the transactions done digitally are done in the local currencies predominantly. So WeChat has a larger database, a customer base in mainland China with over 900 million users, but they have a greater presence in across greater China, including Hong Kong, parts of Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia, where they offer two things. One is the ability for overseas uh, Chinese or Chinese traveling overseas to transact using their WeChat accounts and so helps gets the conversion done into the local currency. And secondly, local wallets. So Hong Kong has its own WeChat wallet, and WeChat's got about six licenses for local wallets uh, in the region, right? So that's one key element to understand that it's facilitating transaction between two individuals. Effectively, when WeChat and Alipay uh, came into being, they are facilitating peer-to-peer -peer payment or payment from an individual 
to a business. That's where Alipay came about. WeChat Pay followed up about four to five years later because WeChat was created later as well. Now, the key element with the how well WeChat became so prominent is WeChat was used through the WeChat app, and that's the most dominant mobile app. So when people were conversing and WeChat was able to develop gaming into the system as well as bring in some form of e-commerce, people were able to pay through that. Uh, the Chinese New Year and the red packet, so digitalizing the red packet was the big change where Chinese people started using WeChat for payments, and now it's prevalent. Like 90% of all mobile payments done in mainland China are either through Alipay or WeChat Pay, almost evenly divided. So when you compare that to Facebook and Libra, Libra is a basket of currencies uh, which will be, you know, it'll be using the U.S. dollar, the euro, as well as the Singapore dollar, and hence it will be stable. It'll be a basket of currency that's giving you a stable rate, and hence then you're using the Facebook Libra token to transact. So hence the reliance becomes on Facebook for you to ensure that these transactions are done at the right rate. Whereas when you consider WeChat Pay, etc., they're just transferring money at the local uh, currency and ensuring that it's done real time without any differences. Now, interestingly enough, uh, on mail in China, you now require your mobile wallets to be tied to a local bank account. And for, because of that, uh, everybody's transactions can be tracked. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look at Libra, there's no requirements for it to be tracked by anybody. And then hence, the KYC and money laundering comes into question because the regulators cannot check or control the flow of cross-border payments. Right. Professor Sarah, when we look at these cashless payments, the use of mobile, mobile devices to pay um, either a business or pay uh, somebody else, um, is there a competition between this type of payment using mobile devices and cryptocurrencies, or do they complement each other? Uh, there is quite a bit of competition. All of the cryptocurrencies would love nothing more than to replace Venmo. They would love nothing more than to replace all of the other uh, forms of payment that people use for mobile payments. Um, that has been difficult for the cryptocurrencies, though, because the underlying technology of blockchain uh, has until recently been slow. It has typically incurred long latencies uh, to finalize transactions. So it has been used over the Internet. It has been used uh, across uh, geographies, across continents, etc. But it hasn't been used in everyday payments. It hasn't managed to actually threaten any of the existing mobile payments providers. But we, I expect that to change in the coming years. Uh, in the coming year or two. Right. Uh, Lin Peng, uh, we've become so used to uh, the use of currencies backed by central banks, and there is an implicit trust in that. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of a challenge will it be uh, to convince the ordinary public of the benefits of using things like cryptocurrencies? So I think in China, people are very used to their digital payments because uh, we use WeChat, we use Alipay. And, uh, but the key difference is um, our wallet is tied to the bank accounts. So it's still like a settled at the um, central bank level. So it's uh, uh, still like a fiat money digitalization thing. So when people get used to the cryptocurrencies, they have to first understand the, the technology. Not just, you know, the all hypes, no code thing, like blockchain can solve everything. So um, it's really like the focus should be what benefits it can, can bring, not just to ordinary people, but traditional businesses. Like a lot of traditional businesses, they are exploring the blockchain potential to see how the blockchain technology can help them to facilitate their existing operating problems, like uh, lack of efficiency, and lack of security and a lot of like a very high transaction costs. So um, they would think about something like, you know, if we can use uh, this kind of smart contract uh, automation and if we can uh, transfer the value uh, through blockchain in a very secure way, maybe we can um, really like transform our business model to, an, to the next level. So I think when people start realizing, you know, they're not just the technology, but also the benefits the technology can bring to the table, and they probably don't need to know the very complicated public key, private key, um, and other algorithm that embedded underneath the technology, but they should be comfortable thinking, you know, if we put our trust 
on the algorithm. And if we, we put our entire business infrastructure, infrastructure on the technology, we can feel comfortable going forward. So I think that the, the central point is still trust. Like we, we used to trust a bank, and now we used to, to trust this algorithm, this technology. So it's going to take some time. So every time we, when we talk about mass adoption, we think about, OK, it's going to come during the next three years, five years. But uh, the, the, the time of period does not really matter so much. It's really like whether or not your business would benefit, whether or not consumer would benefit, and, and then like a, what, to what degree you can get yourself prepared for that. Okay. Paul Sin, one final question. Uh, the U.S. dollar currently enjoys quite a bit of hegemony uh, when it comes to international transactions. When it comes to China's push for blockchain technology, could that change? Professor Sarah told us earlier on that that probably explains some of the resistance uh, at the White House. But, you know, um, despite the White House resistance, could it change? I, I actually don't think China will adopt cryptocurrency at all. Uh, did, did we may use digital currency, but we, may, we will not use crypto. So when President Xi talks about adopting blockchain, actually, he is actually talking about uh, the enterprise users. He mentioned like trade finance, supply chain, healthcare. So these are actually enterprise data exchange or synchronization projects. Um, so and I think uh, in the future, uh, the development will be more on uh, how to um, have a more permission-based blockchain so that the governance model is in place and uh, less uh, regulatory constraint is uh, hindering the adoption. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.